presentation on data science in economics initiative. And actually, we're going to have more than the people listed as presenters and participation. And I jo just want to make uh, say that uh, this is uh, going to be, I think, the first presentation we make uh, within the group of what we call the Barcelona GSE Data Science Center that is um, linked very much to the uh, people that are running the data science program, which, uh, uh, of course, is something a little bit out of the core of the Barcelona GSE, but it has turned out to be more and more central in economics and applied economics, and many, many more people are actually participating now uh, in this group, but it was uh, led by Homiros, who uh, put a lot of effort, time, initiative at the very beginning, um, with Christian von Rosen, who is not here today because he's on leave uh, visiting the United States now. And I, I'm just gonna let the uh, micro to Homiros to explain you about this. But this is a, let me just say that we also welcome initiatives of research groups uh, across the whole community that uh, would like to have more, um, um, you know, a little bit more of strength and uh, projection. And we're actually working, analyzing a uh, one group that has already made a proposal. So I encourage all of you, if you are working across uh, in specific field or cross fields, but in a research group, uh, research ideas that you think we could help out to get it stronger, we can talk and uh, make it happen, okay? So, Omiros, thank you for you and the whole group and introduce them as they come, right? Okay, so um, first let me thank uh, Julian who asked us to make a presentation today. I will talk briefly in the beginning about first the what this um, center is. Um, so let's see if this works. Uh, don't lock it, yeah, I think it's fine. Um, so uh, you can, it's Windows, so it will take a lot of time here. But, uh, and data science is all about not Windows, but uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, there you are. So, um, so the Data Science Center is, uh, is a, if you like, an institution that um, is uh, coordinating all sorts of data science activities that we carry out at Barcelona GC, and there are actually a lot of them. So, of course, the uh, if you like, this is the website. Um, uh, you can visit the website and figure out all sorts of things about the um, the, the center. So, basically, one of the, of course, original activities was uh, a master in data science, the, the first master of this kind in Europe, and uh, I think the first master of this title ever, anywhere. Um, and um, a program that has been, I think, quality-wise, extremely successful. Uh, I'm very proud of the way it has uh, evolved over the last few years uh, and the kind of quality of people we, we recruit. And the program, I think, uh, I, don't, will, I wouldn't want to replicate uh, not exactly correct information, but I think it, it ranks highest in satisfaction in all coordinates, except one, which is second to the highest. In terms of co like satisfaction by students, by satisfaction by staff, and all sorts of uh, other other uh, quantitative aspects, if you like, of, of, of people, people's reception to it. So I think we're very happy about the way we work with GSC on, on this front. But that was the starting point. Uh, the whole point of the center is to do much more than that. So this year uh, was the, this year was the first year that we actually um, organized a summer school. Uh, last year, it would be of course one every year. Uh, the, there were two weeks in this, and the first week was like oversubscribed by 40 people, I think. So it was 60 people, and there were like 40 people in a waiting list. Uh, so that was ex extremely successful. The second week was also very successful. The second week is much more related with the things we will be talking about today. So you will get a bit of a better idea of what uh, we're trying to do there. Um, there are this, the, the, the center also organizes workshops. These workshops are uh, sort of uh, somewhere between, of course, uh, the master program and the, for, uh, and the summer school. They are kind of, uh, it's a different sort of product, if you like. Uh, sometimes it addresses the um, research community. Sometimes it addresses also the industry. Uh, and uh, we, from this year onward, uh, we start charging people for attending these workshops, okay? Our, our master students get immediate access to it, but, uh, but other people have to subscribe. Now, uh, there is also another part of activity which has to do with um, 
doing, if you like, both scientific and industry type consulting. So we already have a few customers. They, they have very different characteristics. So for one of them, for instance, is a whole university who wants us to coordinate part of their program uh, by contributing to it. Uh, another customer is actually this person, for example. Uh, so you might have like uh, a GSE professor who wants to do something specific that is, involves a data science component and we can undertake finding the right person and guaranteeing the quality and, and supervising the procedure when necessary. Uh, or jointly engaging in, in the project if, uh, if that's the case. Uh, for example, another recent client is a very interesting startup in Barcelona on insurance. Uh, uh, actually, they do something very interesting, in fact. So that's another, uh, there's another one. Uh, and we're trying to expand on these directions. Um, but apart from all of these things, the, the uh, primary goal of Barcelona GC is to do research. And, and the final and most important aspect of our work is to do research uh, in, the, in the frontier of uh, economics, if you like, and in, in intersection with data science. So um, what I would like to talk about now, and it will be, uh, if you like, uh, uh, detailed in a, much, uh, in, in, a, in a much more precise way by the following talks, is a sort of um, a project that we try to develop jointly uh, within the Barcelona Grad School of Economics. Uh, two people coming from statistics and machine learning, that is uh, David Rochelle uh, and myself. Uh, David, that, you, that was introduced to you earlier. Um, and, and two people coming from, from social sciences and doing very, if you like, um, uh, uh, frontiering work in the quantitative side of, of research in social sciences, uh, that be uh, Hannes uh, and, and Steven, that uh, you probably all know. Um, now, the... What I would like to basically highlight here is a very high level description of this joint research agenda, which I think is indicative of the potential of doing uh, some uh, real contribution to research in social sciences by a synergy with data science in a way that, that would not have been possible without the synergy. Now, you might, from all these words that I've been using, you might re realize that we're applying for a ERC grant, so I have to, <laughs> to try all this terminology on you. And the, the hype, uh, excuse the hype, but there's no money without the hype. So, um, uh, but there is a content, so there is a substance in it. So let me just, uh, let me just give you the idea of the, of the thing by saying that, I mean, at the end of the day, so ERC stuff here, um, uh, but uh, the idea is to uh, basically provide key uh, insights and, and, if you like, uh, policy making uh, useful uh, uh, suggestions uh, to the following four problems. And there are four problems that they, they re relate with all sorts of completely different but important aspects of our everyday lives in a way. So one being uh, prevention and prediction of conflict, another being uh, the understanding and the improvement of macroeconomic policy, another being understanding the network structure of the economy. Actually, last talk was somehow related to this, um, to this aspect we're thinking of here. Uh, another one which is very different from the above actually is understanding uh, and measuring the public opinion. That's a very central uh, uh, question these days. And, and also understanding the effect that certain, um, uh, if you like, media or, 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 or you know, social media, et cetera, might have on it. Okay? So there is, again, uh, the aspect of predicting opinion and understanding what is influenced by. Uh, okay? So you might think that all of these things are like, uh, yeah, we're going to make the world a better place. Uh, and by answering more or less everything. But what is interesting, I think, and that's what I would like to focus my sh short uh, presentation and then uh, let the other people give you some more convincing arguments, is that they actually are all subject to a common set of challenges, which is common, of course, to all of these concrete problems that we are interested in really in solving. But I think they are common to many other uh, problems in social sciences these days. So let me take you through this point. Um, there is, um, if you like, three themes that I think they are defining this intersection uh, uh, we are interested in. So the first is that there is a real technological advance that makes us hope that we can pr provide better answers to these problems. And, the, and that technological advance has to do with the availability of data that has not been available before. So there is a regime shift, there's a, a regime uh, switch uh, in, the, in the sense of the available data for these problems. Um, and there is a particular characteristic of this data that they are very much unstructured. So let me give you a concrete example. I mean, one, one type of data set, one type of data, if you like, that is, is recurrent in these applications that I've mentioned to you before uh, is text. 
Okay? Text might be in the form of uh, uh, news articles, which we could use for uh, uh, understanding conflict and predicting it. You will hear Hannes talking about that. Text might be in the, for, in the form of board meeting announcements and the way the, the board meetings uh, um, influence or, uh, the macroeconomic um, a policy, and you will hear, for example, Stephen talking about it. Uh, but, but also in the form, for example, of, of Twitter data on elections, there's been, there's been a lot of literature on, on whether there is a signal on, on such information for understanding and predicting uh, election results, etc. Okay. So the, the point is that it's easy to describe what this data is, is like a news article, but actually a news article is not something that traditionally would fit in any of your uh, models that you've worked with in the past. So it's, and it's actually, that doesn't have a particular structure either. Okay, you might think of it as an image, you might think of it as a word. Actually, even the way you start thinking about it is already part of finding some way to work with it, okay? It's not obvious. Uh, the simplest possible, if you like, evolution of data sets that we use in social sciences from the past to present, uh, you don't have to go as exotic as text or, or satellite images or whatever. Uh, it's, it's basically the, it's a, it's a kind of, if you like, transposition of your usual data set. So in the past, you used to have quite a lot of observations relative to the number of variables. Actually, now you have many more variables relative to the observations. Um, and that's sort of this wide versus long rectangular data set is something that economics has be picked up, has picked up upon recently. Uh, but even when you start applying your usual or this one step evolution of your usual techniques to these things, you immediately start having some issues. And, and you will hear some of that from, from David in a moment. So even, even if you just take the usual kind of data set and you transpose it to the modern reality, you, you already are outside the, the realms of standard research in, in social sciences. Um, uh, in any case, uh, the fact that the data is unstructured, uh, also that they are kind of different, and, and, and actually that you have to work with a combination of data, so there's, you know, there's heterogeneity in the data that we use. Some of them might be microeconomic variables, some of them might be uh, text, some of it might be images, etc. cetera, uh, makes it uh, a challenge how to fit it or how to create a paradigm to work with kind of, such, such kind of data. And the integration of data is, is the real challenge, if you like. Now, another thing which I think is very interesting, and, and social sciences can make a real uh, contribution to what we call big data, uh, is that uh, in social sciences, I think, especially, it, the data is big in some little ways, but it's small in all others. So in, in what I mean by this is that, for example, many of the phenomena we're interested to understand and predict, they are very infrequent. So you really have very small number of replications. You might have a lot of information per, per, per incidence, but you have very few of them. Um, the same thing happens with elections. I mean, you know, you have a lot, you have a lot of data per election, uh, a lot of articles published, you have a lot of opinion polls published, you have some surveys, some of which are very detailed, but you have very few elections per country, for example. Uh, it's not just that the fact that the data is not too much anyway, is that it's actually typically subject to important temporal and spatial variations that you don't want to necessarily assume that doesn't exist and assume they are all IID from some common population, which, be, which would be your canonical assumption in a machine learning type prediction problem. Okay. So there is real, real features that make working with big data within social sciences different from other, uh, if you like, uh, application areas. And all of these characteristics are common in the examples I gave you before. Now, second is that, um, uh, you know, I think a there is a real uh, interest from policymakers into uh, timely and accurate predictions. So the prediction is not completely, if you like, a secondary uh, issue, maybe the one that social science should not be worried about. I mean, here is basically uh, just a couple of quotes from, from important, if you like, um, um, stakeholders in, uh, in, in, in politics and in, in, in economics about the importance of coming up with, um, with predictive models that they have certain ac accuracy. And uh, machine learning, uh, which has been mentioned a couple of times already in this meeting, uh, can be, uh, I mean, has, has, has basically demonstrated over the last 15, 20 years tremendous success in prediction. But of course, it requires certain kind of data, which is not necessarily available in these problems. Okay, so that's another issue. How do you actually use machine learning for prediction, especially in the regimes of these kind of problems we're interested in here? Now, the third, um, if you like, uh, common feature in all these applications we're interested in and somehow define this synergic agenda is that, yeah, okay. But, Prediction is important for policy making, but what actually is probably even more important is evaluating intervention. Right? Actually, uh, that was very much the content of the last talk, in fact. Uh, and uh, if, if the, the simplest canonical problem in this, in this uh, description is estimate treating, uh, treatment effects, which is your, your canonical econometrics kind of problem, 
but when you have hundreds of instruments, okay, so this, that, that you're back in this kind of wide format, and it's really surprising that what you might think is reasonable, it doesn't turn out to be so, so reasonable. So there, this is already something that is being picked up in the economics literature, and David is going to be talking about this kind of uh, problem and our ideas about how to go about them in a moment. Um, on the other hand, to, do, to, to evaluate intervention, you might not want to, to sp split your sort of uh, world into the one that you are trying to explain and the rest you're trying to explain it with, but rather think of the whole system as a system and try to model the whole system as one. So you have some sort of holistic model for the whole underlying system. And once you tr learn this from data, uh, then um, you can basically try to intervene and see how things would change if you were to do certain changes on, on the system. And what is interesting, I think, as a point of view here, is that machine learning is not necessarily useful just for prediction, but machine learning can be useful also for, and in actually also high dimensional statistics, uh, uh, for building such holistic models okay, that integrate all sorts of different data. Um, now, what I would like to um, finish my presentation with, is the next three, four slides, is uh, some, so these are some common challenges, if you like, in these problems. Now, the following are a common set of ideas that can be exploited and, and, and pursued to come up with a, a paradigm for working in modern uh, data set realities in social science, okay? So one, um, one, one key idea uh, is basically that you can, use the you can use machine learning algorithms for learning useful representations of unstructured data, okay? This is something that, uh, if you like, in our jargon, you might call feature extraction, okay? So as I said, if, you know, news articles is, text, it's sort of some, some data, but how do you actually transform that into something that might be useful for the problem at hand? Uh, so um, but machine learning can be very useful for that. So I'll show you a couple of, so Stephen is going to talk later about, for instance, some of the ideas and some of the algorithms that are out there for, for doing this useful representation of text. I want to show you a couple of ideas from image, uh, just to show you something that you find. You, know, you have to see something of it that looks kind of remotely interesting. So I'll show you something that is kind of remotely interesting. And it's also characteristic of potential, also sort of low-hanging fruits that there are out there. And, and uh, I think the economics, um, uh, if you like literature and, and, and research, hasn't necessarily picked up upon. So, so this PCA is, is the mule of what we call unsupervised learning, okay? So this little donkey has been going around for like 50, 60 years now, is the, logistic is the logistic regression of supervised learning, okay? So PCA is basically one way to um, get some structure from high dimensional data, and we are all familiar with it, more or less. Um, now, so it's something that more or less, uh, a, you know, every, every kind of scientist who would work with data has heard of or, or has used a few times. Um, now, for, on the other hand, non-negative matrix factorization, and, and the, there are some ideas here which, uh, again, people are familiar with that somehow PCA might relate with some latent factors, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's, now, you can actually take all these ideas and make epsilon difference to, to them, and you get what is called non-negative matrix factorization. Now, what I find kind of pretty amazing is that this is something that you know, all of you know, and this is probably something that maybe none of you know, but this, has, this article, which appeared in, in Nature, has 10,000 citations. Okay, so this is not some obscure thing hidden somewhere. It's, it's actually mainstream in some areas. So there is also some kind of communication issue that we are working on, if you like, in a way that we're part of that transfer of, of technology. So what is interesting about non-negative matrix factorization is that it does some kind of very similar decomposition as PCA. It's basically decomposing data into some common principal components sorry, some common, if you like, loading matrix and some factors, idiosyncratic, that's a very similar thing. The only thing that it changes is that it asks all the elements of the matrix to be positive. I mean, when you do your PCA, you're positive, some, some are negative, okay? So what I want to show you is that changing the, the regime from uh, that to this creates a completely different way to represent unstructured information. That potential is much more useful. So let me just explain you what happened. So what you see here and what you see here is basically the loading matrices of this analysis, okay? It's a loading matrix. It's just that because this, this is the data that have been used to, to extract this information is images. You can, you can plot them as an image. This is a basically a direct extract from the Nature article I was telling you about, okay? It's 99. So 
what is interesting to understand here is that when you actually take images and you try to extra extract this uh, uh, me loading matrix and, and the corresponding factors, the, the factors is one for every image, and then the loading matrix is the one that you take linear combination with your factor to produce the, the image you actually have. What you have is that PCA, what would do is that it would pick up an average face. This is face recognition, okay? It will pick up an average face, and then it will do little pluses and minus on the face to basically create your face, okay? So basically, it tries to capture some mean, and then tries to capture uh, deviations like around the nose, and maybe your nose is a bit bigger than the average, and your eye is a little bit smaller. So it goes locally and does these kind of changes, okay? If you ask that all these elements and all these elements are positive, you find something completely different. Basically, the loading matrix now picks up. You don't see that very well with the resolution of this. But it, start picking up, it starts picking up uh, s components of an image, noses, ears, uh, eyes, etc. Okay? So now the, 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 the actual face uh, is basically made by putting the nose a little bit here and the ear a little bit there, making it there. So it completely, it represents the same information, but in a completely different way, potentially one which is much more useful for, for prediction or for learning in general. Okay? So this is just a, a, a small uh, change in, in a very familiar model, one that you're all familiar with, but it could make a huge difference. And I think there, there's, this underlying principle goes a long way in extrapolating something from things that are familiar, some things that they are out there and we should be using more. Uh, and of course, you might have heard, so I'll just put the next slide, that this idea has been taken even further with a new technology, if you like, of things, which goes quite beyond PCA, if you like, so the connection here is quite direct, uh, is with what we call deep, deep neural networks. Okay, so deep neural networks also have this capability of extracting uh, different resolutions of information from data and, and trying to learn very low uh, level resolutions, which are basically colors, uh, uh, like angles, etc., to basically very uh, high resolution of ideas, which is basically uh, wheels or you know faces or birds, etc. Okay, so it starts learning these things uh, from from data. Uh, mind you, both this and okay, this has been trained on, on on billions of images, and this has been actually this actual data has been has been trained on on thousands of images. Okay, so these are results that are obtained from big data uh, or at least quite big data. If you like. Now, why I'm saying all this is because basically just to point out that one way that machine learning can be used uh, is to take your unstructured data, try to extract some features from this, uh, and then use them. Uh, for your within a model that you are already using, or you expand your model in a way. Yes, please. Uh, the slide with the faces. Yeah. In what aspect is the animal uh, better? You said it's better. Way it's better it's basically uh, okay. So it's better because actually, when you, if you look at how it, it 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 reproduces, it does better work. But it's completely different because it changes because of these constraints. It changes the paradigm, and instead of trying to learn some average and deviate from it, it star starts learning learning uh, aspects of your face learning ears, learning eyes, learning mouth. So it starts doing a completely different reconstruction. Uh, it's, it, its performance is better in terms of, of basically it's misclassification or if you like any measure you, 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 you look at. But it's also doing something very different. Yes, and this example would be it spits out an image that's closer to the original than the average. Yes, okay. exactly. But it also gives you a much sparser representation of the actual data in, in one's kind of useful. It starts telling you that you know, your data is made of, your, your face are made of noses, ears, and eyes. They're not made by some blurred version of face plus minus stuff. Does that depend on the fact that you know? By the way, sorry, that's why you see that the, 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 the corresponding uh, factors, they are much sparser here than here. So here you need much smaller things to reconstruct the face than, okay? Yeah, yeah, sparsity is, is, is a... My question is, does it depend on the fact that you know where the, where the, where the outcome has to be? The of course not. Of course not. I mean, this is basically, in fact, this is unsupervised learning. So basically, this is, you, you just feed the algorithm faces, and that's what it gets out automatically. Okay. But you feed the algorithm with the answer. No, there's no answer. It's unsupervised, this one. This is just unsupervised learning. Right, so basically, that's one thing. Um, the other, the other uh, key idea, so one key idea is that you could use machine learning algorithms. You can extract some information, feed it, but it's not obvious how exactly you should do it. So I'm not giving you an answer here. I'm just giving you like the first step of an answer. The other is that uh, there is this thing which we call generative models. I'll, I'll explain in a second, and, and Stephen is going to give you more detail. And I think, generally speaking, 
Generative models can be pretty good idea for big data that are actually small, in the way I have it described. So, um, so let me just explain in a slide what I mean. Okay. So if you like regression and its variants, um, what they really do is they model the the output variable given the inputs. Okay, that's what they do. Um, now, what generative models try to do is work instead with the the whole thing, the output and the input, and try to learn a model for everything. So, in actually, in fact, they, they 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 don't try to learn the model for the output given the input. They try to learn the model for the input given the output. Okay. So, and then if you have a model for the input given the output plus a little bit more, you can. You use Bayes' theorem to obtain the output given the input. This is basically uh, what in classification is called a Bayes classifier, as opposed, for example, to logistic regression, uh, and where in, in regression it's called inverse regression. Okay. So now, why this is a, an interesting thing to do is that it, the, I don't want to go into any details here, but I can tell you if you want later. Uh, there is even some complexity theory that says that this is actually a pretty good idea if you're in this situation where x is very high dimensional, but you have very small replications of this, okay? So uh, in, in a sense, uh, for example, it might make more sense, instead of trying to predict the election results from polls, the, the, you have a lot of polls published every year, and, and then you basically try to predict the election result on the basis of the polls, you might try to look how polls look like given the election result, and then invert, which is basically in a, in a, in a, a bit of a simplifying way, is to a large extent behind the sort of paradigm that Nate Silver started using for predicting elections. Okay, it's very closely related. So, uh, and in fact, some of the ideas that you will see later from Stephen in particular is doing exactly this kind of thing. And finally, that um, uh, if you want to, see, to, to, to integrate different types of data uh, in a common model, especially one of these type of holistic types, um, we believe that a Bayesian hierarchical models is, is a principal way to do this evidence synthesis, okay? So there is a lot of t technology out there for how to build Bayesian hierarchical models, and not only how to build, but even more importantly, how to estimate them efficiently. So there's been a lot of progress over the last 20 years on, on uh, computational methods for, 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 for learning such models from, from data. Uh, that's part of my work, actually, so I'm not going to talk any at all about this today. Uh, but I would just like to stop here and, and now um, give the opportunity to David First, uh, who goes second? <laughs> Everyone goes sec second. Uh, David, let's say, uh, Stephen and, and Hannes, uh, in some per permutation of this order, to, um, <laughs> to basically explain to you, uh, in particular, um, to give you more detail on the uh, four projects that we're interested to work and basically highlight this, this, uh, this aspect I just explained, okay? Thank you very much. So, I mean, again, uh, basically the idea is to just give super, super high level ideas on some of the developments that there have been um, in statistical methods to deal with very large amounts of data. Um, large in the sense that Omiros was alluding to, that uh, we are measuring many, many features, variables, say, but the sample size is not very large. Yes, I'm not going to take a, a talk about any of these super unstructured, fancy applications. Just think, if you will, as uh, your typical um, regression framework. N is not too large, but you're measuring a zillion things just because you can. Um, and so I'll just sort of overview, uh, give a few examples where these could be relevant. Uh, then uh, uh, Stephen and Hans will uh, expand upon that, yeah? Uh, so, um, right. Uh, also uh, mention some of the uh, projects that I've been uh, involved in. Uh, and some of them are not going to be from the social sciences, just, just for fun. But again, it, it alludes to this sort of transfer of technology across, across different fields in science. Yeah? Um, so, so, okay, so, so the, the, the typical term for this type of uh, problem in statistics, that typically uh, people talk about high dimensional inference. Um, and, and uh, well, high dimensional comes from the fact that we've got, again, these, these super long data matrices. We're measuring a, a very large number of variables, P, uh, and the sample size N is small relative to P, okay? So statistically, it's a very hard problem because we want to learn about many things potentially, but the amount of information is, is limited, right? So N is, is, is small. Um, and so some canonical examples over here, simplest one, and again, is just a regression model where you're trying to understand how one outcome, Y, depends on a bunch of predictors. There's P of them. 
Um, and so, and so that's, that's uh, you know, perhaps the easiest setting. But this idea can then be generalized to more, you know, to fancier uh, settings. Say maybe you could be looking at what's called graphical models. So now instead of, instead of having only one outcome of interest, maybe you have P outcomes of, of interest. Say you've got like panel data or something like that. Um, and you're trying to learn how each of these variables are related to each other. Maybe to learn about causal structure or, or something like that. Okay. Um, and so this is, this is uh, again, uh, hard. Uh, it's, 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 in fact, harder than this one because here you're just trying to learn how this one, y, depends on, on all of the others. But here you're going to try to learn how each of these guys depends on all of the rest, and then you're going to do the same for each of them. So the complexity of the problem here, it's order p. Now here it's order p squared, so it's, of course, uh, even harder. Yeah, And you could build even harder stuff like a graphical regression, so maybe you have a now a bunch of outcomes. You want to learn how they are interacted with each other. So this is the idea of graphical models. But you also want to regress them on a bunch of predictors. And if both, if you have many y's and many x's, this can of course become very complicated uh, very quickly. Okay. Um, and again, there's extensions to causal inference factor models and many and many other uh, settings. Okay. So I'm, go I'm mostly going to be focusing on this the canonical sort of linear regression, but then these ideas and the theory and everything can sort of be extended to these other uh, settings, okay? So, so that's, you know, that's one type of data that comes uh, into play, as, as you know, quite often. Um, and I'll, I'll go over some examples in a second in case, in case um, uh, well, just to motivate it. Um, but then the question is, what kinds of things do we want to do with it? I'm going to consider mainly three. Uh, one is we want to gain understanding by using this data. This, in, in statistical jargon, is typically uh, mentioned, uh, referred to as model selection. So, for instance, you want to learn which of the x's are truly related to y, for instance. Okay? So you want to trying to learn about the underlying structure of the phenomenon that you're trying to, to study. Okay? Um, another might be an estimation problem, uh, such as Omidos was just mentioning a moment ago, so treatment effects. Okay, so if I were to do some policy, x1 might measure uh, x1 is equal to 1. If I do a certain policy, 0 if I don't do it, what's the, what's the effect of the policy going to be on my outcome y? But I want to account for many other potential uh, covariates. Yeah? So there's many other axes I want to consider here. This is a challenging problem methodology, uh, methodologically. Yeah? Or maybe just care about predicting. So how do I best forecast a future y given all of the axes? Okay? So these just three super basic operations. You're all familiar with these things. The only new thing here is that uh, dimensionality is very large, and that is going to make things a bit, a bit hard um, from the statistical side. All right, so just to uh, sort of uh, um, point out some of the uh, some applications where these might be relevant, uh, this is an example uh, take, uh, taken from this article from Belloni et al. Uh, this one of economic perspectives. Um, so this is an application where um, what these authors are considering is that uh, in certain situations, the US government may decide to take private property. But if they take your private property, you can actually then go to court and try to well, say that this seizing was illegal, right? And then the court could decide on your favor or against you. And if they, fight, if they decide on your favor, they're upholding individual property rights. And that might have, might have an effect on house pricings in the future in that, in that region. Okay? So they wanted to sort of look whether there was evidence uh, with respect uh, in terms of this. They had a relatively small data set. They only had 183 uh, um, measurements uh, in different circuit courts, so different regions at different times. Um, and the, so, so, so the sample size is quite, okay, this is not, it's not working. Okay. Well, never mind. Um, okay. I'll just use my fingers, yeah? Um, so, so N was quite small. Then the outcome of interest, uh, they were looking at, at home prices uh, in the log scale. They really wanted to, to measure whether the number of pro plaintiff decisions taken by a circuit court does have an effect on the outcome. That's what they want to learn, OK? But then they will to take into account that there's a bunch of other things that might be affecting the, the home prices, right? So you, you can't just look at the correlation between this guy and this guy. There's many other things that matter into this problem, such as information about the, the region or the judges. They consider 147 variables, but you could easily consider, consider many other, the characteristics of, of the houses, uh, previous price dynamics in that area, so on and so forth, yeah? Um, so, so the point here is that you've got 183 observations. You've got on the order of 150, say, variables. 
you can't just run ordinary list of squares. This is going to be a horrible idea. The precision is going to be horrible. Uh, so, so you have to do something else, okay? Um, and so, and so, all right. So we want to sort of develop methodology to be able to deal with this in some efficient way. And I'll just give sort of an overview of, of some things that, that people have proposed, uh, completely non-technical. Yeah. Um, th this is another potential application, just taken for fun. Uh, this is uh, something I've been uh, involved in with people at uh, IRB Barcelona. Um, uh, this is about colon cancer. And so the idea here was to try to predict uh, there's a certain gene that happens to be very important for colon cancer uh, progression. Also uh, for the, well, this is this gene, TGF-beta. Um, and so what, you, what these researchers wanted to do is to understand how the expression, so, so there's now technology to measure the expression of all of our genes in the genome. There's about 25,000 of them. So what, what they wanted to do is, well, can I use all of these measurements to predict what's going to happen to this gene that's super important for progression, or maybe can I make some predictions on whether I'm going to have a metastasis in the next five years or not, okay? So this is, of course, relevant for precision medicine and all these kinds of things, right? So diagnostic tests. Um, and so they had a bunch of questions here. One is to, well, first they wanted to understand how the X's are related to the Y's, because that tells us about underlying, in this case, biological mechanisms, right? Um, but they also wanted to see, okay, what happens if I now give some treatment, some drug to these patients? What's, gonna, uh, what's the effect going to be? Um, and they also wanted even to do to prediction, yeah? So, you know, you go to the doctor and they tell, okay, you have, you know, f hopefully many years of life expectancy. Um, so, so this is a problem where you've got a high dimensional vector of predictors, in this case about 20,000, um, and you want to understand and you want to estimate and you want to predict. So you want to do all of these things. Okay, um, so anyway, uh, and ideally, when you do all of these things, if you could, out of these 20,000 genes, if you could find like five or six that do the job, that would be great, right? Because it will facilitate interpretation. You can then uh, get a patent on it, maybe. You can't patent the whole genome, but you can patent five or six. In fact, we have several uh, patents on, on this, yeah, um, that, that came out of, of this work. So, so, okay, so this is another uh, potential uh, example. Uh, there's other examples that I guess uh, Hans and, and Steve are going to explain in much, in, in much uh, better detail. So, but for instance, you could now try to see the outcome could, could be whether there's a conflict, yes or no, in a certain region at a certain time. You might be considering whether you do an intervention or not, like different types of aid, uh, diplomatic visits, or you, the UN sends peacekeepers or whatever. Um, and so you want to estimate the effect of this treatment on the probability of conflict maybe adjusting for a bunch of other things, say characteristics of the region, maybe unstructured text data, uh, whatever it is, okay? So again, another example, I guess. I'll, I'll, I, won't, I won't spend time on it because uh, Hans will do a much better job at, at uh, explaining this, yeah? Um, another uh, application that uh, probably Steve will mention is uh, try to understand trade patterns between co uh, companies. Um, and perhaps how these, so basically you, you might have data on a bunch of companies, you have data on how they trade between each other and you want to learn about underlying trade patterns. Maybe you would want to use what you learned from these guys to then help you predict the effect of economic shocks, say on the, the stock market or, or something like that. Um, so th these are some of the ideas that, that we had in mind. So for this you might, you wouldn't do a regression, you would maybe use these kinds of graphical models or more evolved, uh, sophisticated tools. So these are some of the things that we have in mind. At this moment, we're just brainstorming about it, but hopefully uh, in the future we'll, we'll, we'll be able to show you uh, some progress, yeah? So, so anyway, just uh, four uh, very different uh, applications, but with the common theme, you've got sort of many attributes, many variables, many things you're trying to learn about. Um, and, so, and so there are methodological issues. Okay, and so from a statistical point of view. And so some of the main ones is, well, first is, am I going to be able to get accurate answers from such data? So for instance, if I'm trying to learn which variables really have an effect on my outcome Y, can I actually learn that with some confidence? Okay. Can I get, obtain, uh, can obtain a precise estimate or, or forecasts? Um, so these, these, there's a quite a bit of, methodology uh, already out there. Um, a question that is, is current uh, 
a currently active uh, area of research is how to quantify uncertainty. So the issue is that if you're working with small data, you fit, say, your regression model, and you're going to get confidence intervals, you're going to get p-values, you're done, right? And that's it. You get your paper out, and it's easy, yeah? If p is much larger than n, then uh, the usual p-values, it, it all breaks down. None of it works anymore, okay? All the theory works that breaks down. We need to do something else, okay? Um, and so it's quite hard to do, okay? So I'll, ju I'll just point that out. Um, and so these are things that we want to sort of uh, investigate. And related to all of this is, of course, uh, computation. So first is that you would like, well, to be able to find uh, solutions in reasonable time. But there's a very interesting sort of uh, emerging area of research here, which is related to the notion that, what, yeah, probably guys in the back, you can't see this, sorry. Um, I'll just say it out loud, yeah? So what happens is that fast methods, they're often suboptimal. So there's an inference versus computation trade-off. So there's some algorithms out there that'll do the job, they'll give you an answer super, super fast. But when you study their mathematical properties, the accuracy that they've got, it's typically not very high. So a quintessential example, for instance, is, is for certain types of problems, for instance, Lasso, if you're familiar with this type of uh, methodology, it's super fast. For certain problems, it works wonderfully. But for some other problems, it's really not doing a very good job. Okay? So ideally, what you would want to use to solve some other problem that's much harder computationally, but that's impossible. And so you want to be somewhere in between. Okay? You can't do the ideal thing. That's too hard. You, won't do the, you don't want to do the quick and dirty thing because that gives you unreliable answers. You want something that's sort of in between somehow. Yeah? So that, that's, that's the name of the game. And that's, and that's uh, a tension that, that exists. Um, now, uh, I really don't want to go into any details whatsoever in terms of methodology. I'll just sort of um, overview of things. Yeah? The, the, I think this is the only uh, you know, Greek symbol, the only formula probably that I have in the whole uh, thing. Yeah? But just to, to give an idea. And many of you already are familiar with this, if that's the case. So, okay. so it'll be worth for two slides. Yeah? Uh, so, but the basic idea is, okay, if you have a, you're measuring a, a zillion things, you're trying to learn about, about the phenomenon, and you have a lot of data, how, how can you effectively learn from it? Well, the basic idea is you can essentially only do that if you bet on sparsity. Okay? So you're trying to understand a phenomenon but you're assuming that really this phenomenon follows Occam's razor. It's not that, that complicated, right? So say, I want to see how all of these, I'm measuring many, many variables. I want to see how they affect my outcome of interest. If they all were to affect the outcome of interest in complex, complicated ways, that is hopeless, unless I have huge n, okay? But if it were the case that truly, it's just a few of these that matter, and all of the others I'm measuring just because I can because I have the technology, but not really, because they're really fundamentally related to the problem at hand, then there's hope. Then I could try to learn that, okay? So if I'm willing to bet on that and betting on sparsity, then I can do things. And so the two main frameworks to do that at the moment um, is what's called penalized likelihood, a sort of shrinkage methods. And again, the lasso, if you're familiar, is the quintessential exam example for this. And so just in a nutshell, the idea is that you want to learn about some parameters, whatever that is. This is completely generic at this point. Uh, I'm just going to be calling that theta. And I have some data, D. Uh, and normally, if you were to get something like a maximum likelihood estimator, it would just be estimating theta by, by, by maximizing this first guy. So finding the value of theta that fits the data best as measured by this likelihood function. So the idea of penalized likelihood is that if you were to only do this, you would tend to overfit the data. You would find two complex solutions. So this penalty term helps you find, encourages you to find sparser, simpler solutions. And that actually, in some situations, you can show that it gets you much better theoretical performance. OK? Okay, uh, P is not probability, it's penalty. probability. Yes, sorry. This is horrible notation. Yeah. So this would be the probability for the data, given the parameters. And this, in this case, it would just be a penalty. Yeah. If you're Bayesian, it could be a probability. Yeah, it could be both. Yes, yes. Um, indeed, should have used a different letter. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, so anyway, but I mean, th there's there's good things uh, from this framework. For instance, one is that you can get very fast computations, and typically it's quite good to predict. In s so, for regression, for instance, if you have if the number of under certain regularity conditions, I'm not getting into any technicalities, but if the number of variables that you've got is essentially up to exponential in the sample size, 
so super large, you can still learn things effectively. Okay, so that's quite remarkable. Yeah, the mathematically, I mean, exponen uh, exponentially in n is, is really so. You know, you have 100 variables. You have then uh, uh, sample size is 100. You can deal with order exponent to the 100 uh, variables. Yeah, so that's that's huge. But there are some challenges, uh, and one of them is again that that it is really hard to assess assess uncertainty. So, so 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 anyway. Um, so, so that's, that's root number one. Root number two, which is what uh, Omiros and I are, are closest to in terms of our, our research, is uh, to uh, adopt a, a Bayesian framework. Again, this is sort of like a summary of the Bayesian framework for babies. If you've seen it before, this is sort of an embarrassing. If I haven't seen it before, hopefully at least it gives you the idea. Yeah? Uh, the idea is that we have some question, Q. Now, it's not, the question does not need to be about, about parameters. It would be about future data, whatever. Um, have a question Q, and we have uh, data uh, D, and so basically by formulating probability models, you end up uh, with a, an expression that looks like this. This is just uh, Bayes' theorem, and so you can make probability statements about the question of interest given the data by utilizing this formula over here, and basically, uh, again, if you know about it, great. If you don't know about it, the, the, the main thing about it is that this is beautifully simple in general, right? It's like E equals MC squared. I mean, there's just a couple ingredients in this formula. Everything else sort of, sort of follows, okay? So it's a very general way of proceeding, and the devil is in the detail. Whether the thing th this works or not depends exactly how you formulate each of if these different things. I'm not getting into that, okay? Um, but basically, there's, there's some uh, interesting research directions here, which is, okay, you can formulate this, and you can get answers, right? But how good are these answers? So one important research direction, and I myself have done some work on this, is can we say something about the mathematical properties of this type of formulation, depending exactly how you formulate it. Okay? So if you use this to analyze your data, and then you, and then you recommend some policy, well, can you be minimally sure that, that, that you know, this is going to work, yeah, basically? And another research direction that, that we're looking at with Domino's now is uh, sort of on the, on the computation aspect of it, yeah? Because this is beautifully general, but depending on how you do it, actually the computation becomes very hard. So we want to find some sort of, of uh, compromise. Okay, so, I mean, just, just to wrap up. I mean, I, I realize this is sort of a, a super, um, you know, um, summary. Um, so I'm not saying anything very specific. So to make it a bit more specific, I'll just give you a couple examples. Okay? And again, the, the main underlying idea that I want to communicate this is that there are subtle, apparently subtle things in how you formulate your problem can result in very big differences in the quality of the results that you, that you get from your data analysis. Okay? So this is just an, uh, an example of this. Um, uh, this is, again, related to this colon cancer application. It's just a regression, regressing the expression of one gene, this growth factor, on 10,000 other genes. The sample size is 262, so it's a hard uh, prediction problem in a sense. Um, and here I'm just comparing how different methods do in terms of, well, how many predictors do they end up choosing? How many variables do they end, do they end up including in the model? What's their predictive accuracy? So this is the, the squared correlation between the predicted y and the observed y out of sample. So basically, this is the percentage of variance explained by the model. So the higher, the better. And this is the computation time. And so these th first three guys over here are three uh, versions of this penalized likelihood uh, method. Again, lasso is sort of what's become very popular uh, in, in, in many uh, uh, social sciences projects. So this guy, for instance, does predictions, but uh, it requires 159 axes, right? So it's not a very sparse representation. Um, so, so it's not very easy to interpret. Right? This is saying that my, my gene of interest depends on 159 guys. Uh, prediction accuracy is not bad. It's not as good as some of the other methods. But if you can see now how this fluctuates, depending on the type of, of uh, framework. Um, so this comes out of a paper that I did. So I can, as, as you can imagine, I showed the example because what we did worked well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, for instance, in this particular case, we achieved higher predictive accuracy with only six genes instead of 159. Okay? So this is, again, this is just a detail, right? How you formulate this, you're just clicking a button and run your, your program in R. Yes, but I mean, the actual quality of the results can, can, uh, you know, uh, can vary quite a bit. So, so, so there's many subtleties here. I'm, of course, not, not uh, going in, into them. But um, hopefully, at least you see that this is something that matters. 
Um, just, and just a final example, uh, this time from the uh, social sciences. Um, here, uh, we basically tried to reproduce uh, an example by this paper from Belloni and others on, on uh, well, we're looking at uh, instrumental variable regression, but this is sort of a simpler, simpler setting. So, so the idea is that they wanted to measure what's the effect of x1, just one variable, and y, adjusting for many other x's, okay? Um, and, so, and so if, so of course, the issue, I mean, you guys are all familiar with this, yeah? So I won't sort of go into the details. Um, but the idea is that, well, of course, out of these x's, the problem is that some of these might actually be related both with y and with x, and if we don't include them in the, in the regression, then when we do, when we regress y on x1, then we're going to get biased estimates and reliable inference, okay? Um, and so if we knew which of these many p variables really matter, we would just, I call that x star. So if we know which is the relevant subset that's correlated both with x1 and y, then I would, it would be very easy, right? I would just do a regression where I regress y on x1 and this x star, this relevant subset. Of course, in practice, I don't know what x star is. I would like to learn that from the data, and so that creates some difficulties. If the number of variables were small and the sample size were large, this would not be a problem. If I have 10 variables and I have 2,000 observations, then I could just run ordinary list of squares, and I would just regress y on x1 and, and x, and the whole of them, and that would be fine. The problem if that is if much larger than n, I can't even do that, okay? So I have to do something else. Um, okay, so, so basically, I'll just show you, show you a plot. Um, again, the point here is not to say that we have the best way how to deal with this, just to, to say that how you analyze this data can make a big difference. So what these guys did is this ba they basically criticized this standard method, this, this lasso method. To, there's a way you, to use lasso to tackle this problem. What they did is, all right, they criticized this. They said that this could run you into omitted variable biases, if you know what that is. So instead, they proposed another method that they called the double lasso, and they showed how it worked wonderfully in their, in their uh, examples. And so we just reproduced one of their simulation exercises. So this is just completely fake computer simulated data. Um, and this was done by, by uh, Mikel uh, as part of his Embrace thesis uh, last year. And so this is us reproducing exactly what the authors were showing in the paper. Um, and so let's just focus on, on, on red and blue. So, so uh, that's the, the lasso and the double lasso, the two methods that these guys were comparing. Um, and so the idea is that you're trying to estimate the treatment effect, the treatment effect how they set it up, it was truly one half. So the truth is here. And then this is a histogram of the estimates, a smooth histogram of the estimates that you get when doing this lasso guy. And, uh, and it turns out that the lasso guy is not is centered here, let's say 0 0.60 something, not 0 0.5. So it is biased. And it is biased because sometimes it, it actually substantially overestimates the quantity of interest. So sometimes the estimate is quite close to 0 0.5, but sometimes if you're unlucky, you could basically estimate twice its magnitude, from one half to one, okay? So they said, this is horrible, and you do the guy in blue, which is what they proposed, and then things are much better, okay? Now, what Mikel did, and we didn't tell him this, he just did it out of his own volition, basically he, he repeated their, their simulation exercise, changing slightly the parameters, the settings, okay? And see what happens then? Then uh, the guy in red, he works wonderfully, and the guy in blue sucks. Okay? So the guy in blue now is biased and has a huge variance, whereas the guy in red is, is just wonderful. Okay? The other two guys in, 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 uh, in yellow and, and, uh, and green are, are just two uh, Bayesian alternatives to, to do this, and it's something that he explored in his thesis. But the main bottom line picture that I want to give from here and from the other earlier slides is that apparently deceivingly subtle decisions when doing your data analysis actually can affect quite a bit what you get out of it. So, it's, so you know, that's where we believe we can bring in some value, hopefully, to you guys, yeah? Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. So my current, you know, my, 
my current uh, employer is the University of Oxford, but I guess uh, uh, a few of you will know I started out here, and in a sense, it's good, uh, you know, it's good to come home. Uh, so thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me. So we also don't have too much uh, time left somehow. So uh, I will try to uh, kind of make my points quickly as quickly as possible. So. First, let me clarify that I guess among the four of us, I'm the first quote unquote uh, economist to speak. Hannes will speak after me. So I really want to come into this more from the perspective of what big questions do we want to answer uh, that sort of new data will, will, will let us answer better uh, than, than data we already have. All right, so here's a quotation from Alan Greenspan about uncertainty in monetary policy making. Okay? Uncertainty is not just an important feature of the monetary policy landscape. It is the defining characteristic of that landscape, All right, as I'm sure a lot of you here will know. All right, so I would argue that given that policymakers exist in a very complex stochastic economy, we have very little data available to us to understand that. All right? So for example, Every year, the Federal Reserve in the US makes eight choices, all right? And that's the data we have to try to figure out all of the questions related to uncertainty in the, in the macro economy. That's a huge challenge, all right? So I guess my perspective is that there are other data sources that somehow match the scale of the uncertainty that we're trying to understand much better, okay? So in particular, the work I've been uh, doing recently Uses, uh, uses text data, okay? So uh, given, you know, I have, I guess, 15 minutes, I just want to get straight to it. So there are three sort of senses in which uncertainty is challenging for macro policy, all right? One is just I might not understand the economy, okay? Where the economy is going in the buildup of risks. We can think of that as just kind of a, a forecasting model, all right? Second, uh, not only, so if I'm a policymaker, not only do I face uncertainty in the underlying economy, I face uncertainty in the effects that my interventions on that economy are gonna have, all right? And uh, I face sort of by uncertainty management, I mean, how should I communicate this uncertainty to the public and what effects is that gonna have, right? Because there's some endogeneity between the uncertainty that the public faces and what I choose to tell the public, okay? And I guess, a related problem is the impact of central bank communication. So what do I mean by text data? Well, you get text data both from within central banks, okay, so for, from that, so, uh, I mean sort of press conferences, minutes, verbatim transcripts, uh, you know, forecast policymaker speeches. You also get text data that's generated by agents in the economy outside of a central bank, okay, in the form of media articles and say trading circulars that uh, people sitting on a you know, fixed income desk in London every week are going to get text data uh, sort of describing the, the forces affecting the, the economy. All right? So when I think about text, the inherent property that I think makes it uh, uh, non-traditional data is its vast, you know, the vast numbers of, of, uh, uh, of dimensions of variation in text. Okay? So people in macro often cite this now casting uh, sort of framework as an example of big data, right? Because stock Watson and, and stuff like that. Well, what do they have? They have basically, you know, 250 time series that they stick into a dynamic factor model. In any normal size text database, including all of these, there are thousands or tens of thousands of separate independent uh, uh, data, right? So these are the, the words and their frequency across these documents. So, Somehow, the complexity of this data can pick out signals that are relevant to understanding the effects of uncertainty. So how do we extract information from this vast uh, object? Well, there's basically three ways that have been done in economics so far. So one is basically computing the frequency of keywords. So for those of you who know the Baker, Bloom, and Davis EPU index, that's what they do. Uh, you can also basically estimate uh, hidden structure, okay, which is something that I have done with co-authors, or you can try to predict uh, some quantity of interest using text, okay? So we would think of that as a supervised problem, okay? So uh, Ginskow and Shapiro have the sort of base paper for that. 
So let me uh, describe unsupervised learning. All right. Uh, so there's a very well-known model called latent Dirichlet allocation, which models latent structure in text, and it's very influential. All right. So I'm not sure. You know, I have so little time. I don't think I'm going to do the graph. All right. Uh, I will just describe this to you guys in terms that you might understand as a factor model for discrete data. All right, so what are the factors here? The factors are topics. What is a topic? A topic is a, is a uh, probability distribution over words. All right, so we might have a labor topic in which wage and labor have high probability and other words have low, or we might have a inflation topic where price and inflation have high probability and other words have a low probability, all right? Then we are going to represent each text as a combination of those topics, all right? So the topics are factors, and then each document is going to have a document-specific mixture over those topics, all right? So it really is just a factor model for discrete data. All right, so here's the output of such a model, all right? So this is a topic model estimated on the corpus of FOMC transcripts. Okay, so this is what people in the FOMC talk about during their policy debates during the era of Alan Greenspan. So here are two topics, and in fact, they are two topics that are most correlated with, uh, with uh, the, the business cycle. Okay, so the most pro-cyclical topics, the things that policymakers on the FOMC are most likely to talk about in expansions. Nothing, to come back to a previous question, sort of uh, gave any structure to this. It was just say, go find these kind of factors in the data, and it just so happens that these particular factors, these particular topics, were the ones most correlated with expansions, okay? And yet, they seem highly interpretable, right? So during expansions, we talk about growth, and we talk about, you know, increasing productivity, okay? Uh, so here are times, so these, if you will, are these factors, okay? These are the beta, so, sorry, these are the probability, uh, uh, the, the probabilities attached to individual words within these two separate topics. Okay, so in this, in this formulation, they are the betas. These things are the thetas, okay? These are the document-specific proportions attached to those topics at different points in a time series, okay? And in fact, this is the, the so the FOMC actually has 19 members, this is the, the maximum amount of attention, the median, and the, and, the, and the minimum, okay? So you see there's a lot of kind of cross-sectional cross uh, variation in this data, but there's also interesting time series variation. In particular, if we think about new forecasting models, you see that the, the FOMC's attention kind of leads the onset of, uh, of uh, uh, contractions, okay? So for example, the attention paid to productivity collapses uh, just before we enter the, you know, the, the 2000, 2001 uh, contraction. Yeah? But uh, what you said is unsupervised, which means you input the number of topics. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's the typical thing in, in fact, yeah, right? Well, there are information criteria you can use, or you can, you can relax that a little bit by using non-parametric Bayesian methods. But indeed, here we do a more ad hoc approach. Here are the most counter-cyclical topics. You see, again, they have some forecasting value, potentially, in that sort of a topic about kind of economic weakness rises just before contractions. So interestingly, uh, when you talk about the banking sector, you know, which was most, you know, the, the, the most salient topic, you might argue, in the, in the most recent contraction, there's actually some guy on the FOMC starting in 2005 who spends, you know, a third of their time talking about the banking sector. Okay, but then he shuts up or, sh or she shuts up uh, and, uh, you know, may maybe it's interesting to understand that. Okay, sorry? Uh, well, of course I can, f well, I'm not, sure if the, I I'm not sure that this is always the same person, right? So it's just the, it's just the maximum. All right, so here actually is, is another application from Norway. So these guys collect media data, estimate a topic model, and then take the output of that topic model and do a kind of now casting GDP exercise. Okay, so this is just a plot of Norwegian GDP and the output of this 
Norwegian topic model, in this case applied to media data, and you see again there's a nice, a nice kind of time series relationship. Now all this is well and good, uh, but I want to make the following point. Okay? All of this feature extraction was done in a way that you might argue is completely ad hoc, right? So it's kind of a two-step procedure. The first thing we're going to do is some ad hoc information retrieval exercise, just how do I give this data a rich quantitative structure that I can then feed into some forecasting model or some econometric model. But that's kind of crazy, right? Because if you go back to the data generating process, these documents have no time series structure at all, okay? They're just, you know, we, we, we treat the output of these algorithms as if they were data. But they are not data, right? They are the point estimates of some underlying probability model whose structure is not fit for purpose, right? So what you really want to do is you want to jointly model text and whatever signal it is you're interested in extracting from that text, right? So that's, that's what we mean in this project by building kind of structural models, right? So let's move away from this ad hoc two-step thing where we use, we use these unsu unsupervised learning uh, uh, sort of um, techniques to extract features, right? Let's, let's kind of jointly do all this. Another point uh, that you can make about such models is that forecasting gets kind of a bad name in economics, right? In fact, I, you know, I, I'm learning more and more about uh, macro, okay? Uh, so one thing I've learned is that forecasting is done within a set of models that are quite distinct from the models in which we actually evaluate policy interventions, right? This is kind of the, the difference between VARs and DSG models. Right? So we kind of, you know, we don't want to have this full forecasting model if it doesn't give us some indication of, of, of what structural, uh, you know, forces are leading to the, to, to the media's ability to predict economic fluctuations. But if you were to build this integrated model that we're talking about, you could, for example, uh, figure out how the media, or you know, whatever, Twitter, whatever, uh, how they change their attention as we move through different points in the, in, in the business cycle. Right? So there's this big, this big kind of push to understand how information and expectations shift over the business cycle. So such a model would not just allow you to predict, it would allow you to understand how beliefs, how information, how attention change as we, as we, you know, as we move in and out of the business cycle. So maybe, do I spend three more minutes? Is that okay? Is that fine? Okay. Sorry? Exactly. We're all imposing externalities on the other, and Hannes is the residual claimant. But anyway. Uh, so let me make one more point along the same lines, given I have kind of two minutes to make a point. I love going through the Baker, Bloom, and Davis paper with students because, one, it's incredibly influential, it uses text data, and it has the simplest possible uh, approach you can imagine, okay? So one, I, I guess you could argue that one, you know, one limitation of LDA is that its output is somehow uncontrollable, right? I mean, the factors are the factors but maybe you went into the data with an expectation that you wanted to actually you know, directly measure something. So these guys want to directly measure uncertainty. How do they do it? They again, you, well, I, I guess they combine a few different sources of information, but the, the main source of information is, again, media data, and they just count the frequency of terms uh, in, in media articles, and that's it, right? And then they can generate these beautiful time series plots, and oh, look, when the media talks about uncertainty, uh, 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 and fiscal policy and monetary policy, uh, that sort of correlates with major events that we would expect to have generated uncertainty, right? Then we can plug this index into a VAR and ask questions like, what's the effect of an increase in uncertainty on, on, on the real economy? But let me go back to the idea of kind of endogenous versus exogenous uncertainty. So the Baker, Bloom, and Davis index I, I, I like it, okay, so I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical. But it, in its way, is also very ad hoc, right? I mean, uh, sorry? Well, constructively, okay? Um, so, so people have sort of tried to use the Baker, Bloom, and Davis index to measure monetary policy uncertainty, okay? But monetary policy uncertainty is not some single dimensional object, right? So 
when I track the Baker, Bloom, and Davis uh, EPU index, you know, I would like to decompose that a little bit further, all right? So the Fed, when it sits down to make a choice, faces just some given exogenous uncertainty, right? I don't know what, you know, inflation is going to be two years from today uh, if I've just been hit with a big shock, right? But there's also some kind of uh, endogenous, well, I don't know if endogenous is the right word, but my actions in the economy are also going to have uncertain effects. It, it, uh, in particular, when we are uh, facing the most economic uncertainty, right? So in the, in the Great Recession, when the Fed started engaging in quantitative easing, there was a lot of uncertainty about uh, how that would generate, you know, real effects or not, all right? And it would be super useful to separate those things out, right? So which of these two sources of uncertainty are most relevant for the, for the choices that monetary policymakers make? I think that's a completely open question, all right? And also, how much can and should policymakers influence public uncertainty, right? Because the Baker, Bloom, and Davis index is really capturing public uncertainty through, through, through the media, all right? So you can take kind of the FOMC transcripts, which have a five-year delay in their release to the public, and, and sort of try to tease out these two different, two different sources of uncertainty internally, and then use the, 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 the public aspect of, of communication through minutes or press conferences to try to see how that is then kind of leaked out to the public. Okay, so all I'm trying to say is, uh, you know, within this environment, the ad hoc data extraction tools that are extremely influential in our own field are very interesting, but really need to be unpacked and refined if we want to ask the important questions that we care about as economists, all right? So it's not just about sexy descriptives. It's really about we need answers to these questions. Ad hoc information retrieval can take us maybe halfway or quarter way, three quarters away, I have no idea. But we're only going to get fully there if we can integrate data science with, with, with economic models, all right? And the only way we can do that is if we work together. I could never do that by myself. That's why I need these guys. All right. Hence the need for synergy. OK, perfect. So I came kind of late to this party that these three guys had going. And I know about this for like two weeks. So excuse my kind of I'm catching up. But, but it's, the nice thing is that I'm kind of following Stephen. Uh, and uh, basically, I don't have to explain lots of things that, that he did. So, but my topic is different, right? I'm talking about civil wars, and they're serious humanitarian economic problem. They're also very costly for the international community. And, you know, very recently, there was a press conference uh, on a report by the UN and the World Bank, and, you know, the Secretary General of the United Nations said, you know, prevention of violent conflict is a universal concern. It's not only for those in specific region of income bracket. We are all affected. We must work together in this scorch, right? So, Europe woke up to this, I think, with the refugee crisis. So I think it's kind of, it's kind of general speaking, I think it's a really important problem for the world. And uh, there's a large literature uh, in economics that tries to understand the factors, right? I mean, some of, some of you in the room have contributed to this, right? There's cross-sectional political risk kind of uh, uh, elements, uh, ethnic groups, mountains, you know. Uh, then there's economic shocks, lots of literature on this. Uh, there's growing literature on forecasting and political science. It's very interesting if you look at that in literature, what you find, the factors they find are kind of like, it's the polity stupid, right? So they've really find that the you know, political institutional variables are really kind of the leading variables before something happens. Um, and then the literature on risk and investments, you know, Stephen just said all this already, so I think that's relating to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then there is a literature on prevention, and this is actually very tiny. So in economics, basically, all I know about is, is, is aid. So there's a lot of stuff on foreign aid and how it doesn't work, basically. And in political science, uh, you have a literature on mediation. You have a literature on peacekeeping. And I think what is really interesting here is that I think if you are a policymaker, uh, both of them have their own problems. And I, think I would call that a dual problem of endogeneity. Let me just tell you, because I think this is important for kind of what I'm trying to do in this project that we have jointly. Um, so peacekeeping mediation, this literature basically doesn't care about identification in, in, in the way we think about it, right? Just run the regressions and they find coefficients and they say mediation works, mediation doesn't work, and so on and so forth. Sometimes they do like a, a careful pre-selection of cases so that they kind of are more comparable with each other, right? So that, that would kind of lead to more credible 
uh, estimates, but still, you know, there's a massive endogeneity problem. Because, of course, when do you go into mediate and when do you go into do peacekeeping, that's kind of, it's clearly endogenous. Okay, economists, of course, the smart people we are, we found an exotic, this, the, the big paper by, by Nan and Kian that say, you know, actually what a lot of aid, food aid is driven by is like this uh, food prices in the US. If the, if the US have, a, have an oversupply of food, they at a sudden give food aid to everyone, right? So there's kind of this food aid at a sudden that hits all these countries, and that allows us to study what aid does to conflict in these, in these countries. The only thing, the only problem with that, I think, is that this is a kind of treatment effect that is kind of the stupidest aid that you could give to any country, right? So you're identifying the effect of an exogenous variation, but the fact that it is exogenous is exactly preventing you from kind of studying aid in general. It's exactly the kind of aid that these guys didn't need in that moment. It's just like, you know, take it, you know? And so, so that, I think, generates a problem, right? We have a problem on the one hand side, we have endogenous stuff that's happening that we can't identify really. On the other side, we have the exogenous stuff that I think is not giving us the policy kind of thing. So this is just, uh, this is more a question than I have the answer to. I'm just saying that this is, I think it's, it's problematic. Okay, so let me go to uh, what I've been doing up until now. So there is, um, there is a, there is a kind of big crisis right now in the, in the kind of industry of fragility indices. And it's saying, you know, there's this quote uh, saying policymakers are paying attention to recent history. You know, they couldn't have seen a lot of stuff coming. And the reason is, and I'm going to talk about this very, very briefly, is that all these indices, this is like what most commonly used fragility index that is out there. It's kind of summarizing some variables. And this is four countries that were hit by the Arab Spring and completely destabilized. And what you see, basically, is that all this, the kind of fragility was falling until the Arab Spring hit, and then in some countries, at a sudden, you know, they were deemed very fragile. This is like you have a vase, and you wonder, is this vase fragile or not? And you can either study the properties of this vase, or it can fall on the floor. If it breaks, it was fragile. This is how we currently uh, classify this, OK? So prediction is not great. We know very little about prevention. And I think integrating big data into social sciences can help us with both these things, okay? So um, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna first talk a lot about approaching two sets of unstructured data and then build real-time forecasting, doing this on a daily basis and then try to integrate them into a structural model. And it's very interesting, we, I think the four of us, we, we had like a half an hour discussion about what the word structural means. It's beautiful, right? If you talk to these decisions, they have, the way they think about structural means like, what's the structure that generates the model. We think about like what's the theory behind the thing you're trying to study, right? And so it's a very interesting uh, crossover. Anyway, so okay, getting sidetracked. So this is, uh, we propose a text-based method in an APSR article is forthcoming. We use the standard LDA, again, exactly following kind of the Stephen critique, like we just first look at the text, then we use the thing that we extracted from the text to do the forecasting. Now, very exciting now, we did it. We downloaded until third quarter of 2017 in the new project we're doing, and we look at Spain. We do forecasting of armed conflict. Okay, quarter, next quarter. <laughs> I'm just saying, so this, this is a... <laughs> This is a bad situation. This, is, this, this line up, mark this line just to make you believe this model. This is when ETA said we stop fighting. You see the risk falling. I don't know what happened here. I'm sure somebody who's better in, in Spanish politics knows what's happened here. But, you know, this is kind of shocking. I think this is kind of shocking. Okay, so then this is the, so this is uh, this is the text data then we have uh, satellite data it's also incredibly fascinating stuff the following image is going to have yellow is lights that turned off in syria blue is lights that turned on uh, over a, a period of a few years and white are the lights that were both constant so what you see here is this kind of more or less syria here of the coast where all the cities are you see uh, a lot of turning off light Right? It's like massive, actually. You have this whole area where IS invaded, where basically the whole place turned off, went off the grid. Uh, and then you have, you know, this is kind of reassuring, right? You have this constant Turkey here. You have like constant lights. 
And then you have people running away, I guess, you know, uh, into these areas here and here. Uh, very fascinating. I don't know what to do with it, but this looks very fascinating. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is here, this is, um, this is uh, 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 daylight data now, right? So this is an image, I think, from Aleppo, where you see, I hope you see, like some buildings and some buildings destroyed, okay? So this is what we're doing with the money that we just got, that we're trying to build a classifier that extracts this information in this train to spot when you just show them a picture that the classifier will understand automatically that this contains a destroyed building, okay? So that was kind of what we're, what we're doing. So this is all very nice, but uh, this is very far from the data generating process, right? So I know that there is conflict and non-conflict, and know that there's high risk and not so high risk years, but I'm ignoring that completely when I build the LDA. When I extract the topics from the LDA, I'm ignoring that. And then later I come back to the problem and say, oh, well, what is high risk and low risk? Of course, this is completely silly, right? You should do it the other way around. Actually, I have no idea how I would do that. This is saying, saying I'm doing in this for two weeks. They're trying to explain me this, how, how I would do that, but I think we are gonna get there eventually, but it's not an easy thing for me, you know, even if I would sit down right now and study it for a long time, it wouldn't be easy for me to do it. It's a very kind of natural thing where I can learn from these guys. Uh, but there's another thing is, which is kind of ignores uh, the purpose, right, which is a prevention of kind of the first onset. And the first step would be build a structural statistical model. I'm gonna move very quickly. Uh, I'm not gonna skip that. Uh, okay, so, so here's my model idea of how I would do that if, you know, if we keep cooperating and, and we manage to do this. So countries have an underlying slow moving risk, which is, which has a structure. You could think of a Markov chain, okay? So there's an underlying thing which kind of, what we know, for example, in conflict studies is that after a conflict, you're much more likely to go back to conflict. So there's a natural, natural thing here where, you know, we would give you a kind of, you should have a latent state that is high. You're in danger, no? Fragile, right? This is the latent state. Then there's a random, complete, condition on that, there's a completely random element, which is kind of you're hit by something or not, or there's some, some people inside your country get completely upset. Think of like, you know, this Tunisian idea of like freedom spreading around the uh, Arab countries, right? So that's kind of like a thing that you wouldn't be able to predict very well. That's kind of, but this, you can get from the text. So here, the text you extract from the country will give you hints, right? And then the writing, of course, on the newspaper changes when, as a reaction to the high risk. And the conflict history you have from the country is gonna provide you keys of where you probably are. And of course, the beautiful thing would be to have the text on the one hand side the conflict data on the other side and just estimate the whole LDA with all that structure at the back of it. And then all you need to do is basically you go to the next text, you query it, given the conflict history, and then you back out with the Bayesian model, you back out the, the, the likelihood of conflict that you're in. Much better than what I'm doing currently, right? So like miles away from what I'm doing currently. So this is basically uh, the first idea, the second idea then is kind of to go to, to prevention, right? So and feed on top of it, feed kind of UN resolutions into this, feed kind of things that uh, I would think are, 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 could be driving uh, the prevention. But now use an economics model where, you know, you have somebody maximizing something and add that to the, so now go structural in the, in, in the sense of like the way we understand structural. Right? This was structural the way they understand structural and this would be like have a policy maker who does something and then try to estimate that these policy parameters from the full model, right? But this is completely undeveloped right now. It's like I have this vague idea about how I would do that but I think that's an interesting direction to take at least. Okay, that's it. Yeah.